Tonight, a Canadian first with the Ukrainian president. Vladimir Zelensky sits down with CBC News. He has a lot to say about Canada's support, Russia's attacks, and Putin's threats. Do you think Russia would launch a nuclear strike? Right in front comes Katie Weatherston. She stepped up and won gold for Canada, but says Hockey Canada let her down. I felt like they just threw me to the wayside. I didn't matter. I didn't matter as a person. Now she's speaking out. And as inflation slows, food prices soar. Something has to be done. This is ridiculous. Will Canadians ever catch a break at the checkout? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. The president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has never spoken to Canadians like he is tonight. He sat down with just a few journalists from this country, including our own Briar Stewart. There is really nobody in history who has followed a trajectory like Zelensky, from TV comedian to president to leading his country in the biggest war Europe has seen in decades, with its independence, even survival at stake. Tonight, he took on all questions, thanking Canadians directly for their support as the sounds of explosions echoed overhead. Late tonight, Zelensky announced 10 Russian drones had been shot down over Kyiv. As he sat down with Breyer for a one-hour interview, you could hear some of them in the background. Nice to meet you. Even before Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky begins the interview, a reminder of the threat his country is living under. Was it shot down by the air defense? Yes. And he tells us there's a lot of missiles and drones in the air. One just hit western Ukraine, so he says he'll be frequently checking his phone. I need it for you, especially, because if I will have, for example, message that there is some, you know, possibility that it's the direction is here, I have to tell you, but everything will be good. But we're sitting down with Zelensky at a time when the country is under heavy attack by missiles and hundreds of self-destructing drones sold to Russia by Iran. Iran, Iran transferred drones that are used to kill Ukrainians, and they continue to kill, he says. Just this week, at least four people were killed in this apartment building in the capital and several power facilities were hit. So much has been said about Ukraine's resolve and do you think this increase in attacks by drones and by missiles is going to make people more afraid and perhaps not have people able to carry on with life as they have been? There are moments when it's scary, but we don't have another choice, he says, and we don't have another home. This is very complicated for the entire world and for us. One sec. Sorry. Throughout the interview, more reports of drones. While we're sitting here, a Shahed drone was taken down by troops in the Kyiv region, he says. And later, two bangs could be heard outside above the building. Uh, something is okay. Our defense system is working. Ukraine has appealed for more air defense systems from NATO. And while Canada has none to offer, Zelensky said he was pleased with the government's support. This is more than a partnership. It's almost like being relatives, he says. When it comes to Russia, Zelensky didn't use President Putin's name at all, suggesting that Ukraine would negotiate when Russia was no longer occupying any of its territory, including Crimea. Before 2014, from this point we can try, he said. Any war finishes with a negotiating table. So from that point we can try to solve the question in the diplomatic way. So, Breyer, I know that's just over two minutes of a conversation that lasted roughly an hour. You covered a lot of ground. Well, we had a lot of questions we wanted to ask him. We wanted to ask him about the increasing number of strikes, what it's like to lead a country that's been invaded for eight months now, and also just about the prospects for peace. And he did express worry about this, just the winter because so many power plants have now been attacked. You can see that in cities like this, they're already rationing power. And starting tomorrow, there will be restrictions on electricity all across the country. Okay, so hang tight, Breyer. I have a ton of questions about this moment, his thoughts for Canada your time in the country covering the war. We'll have a lot more of that interview, and you and I will talk about the backstory in a few minutes.
Now, Ukrainian cities may be under fire from drone and missile attacks, but there are signs Russian forces are in trouble in Ukraine's south. <laughs> Russian installed officials began evacuating the Kherson region, getting civilians out on ferries because Ukrainian forces have destroyed bridges, effectively cutting off the occupying Russian force. The general in charge of the invasion admitted the situation is difficult in Kherson. Signaling plans could change depending on the unfolding military situation. And other parts of the south are under fire as well. This missile strike you just saw on an administrative building recorded in the Russian-held city of Enerhodar. Now back in this country, we are learning more tonight about the death of an RCMP officer in British Columbia and learning more about the suspect now charged with first-degree murder. Susanna Da Silva now with the new details and the outpouring of grief. Flowers now overlook the field, still dotted with police markers, a tribute to the officer killed here. I work in mental health and addictions. I was nearly killed myself on the job, and I just needed to come down and pay my respects. The crime still racing through the minds of those who were nearby. They're trying to revive the officer. They were giving her CPR. I wish I was here like 10 minutes ago. Maybe I could stop it. Yeah, it was just, yeah, it was terrible. Police say Constable Shaylin Yang died after being stabbed Tuesday morning. She was checking on a tent in the park with a city employee. Now a 37-year-old man, Jong Won Ham, is charged with first-degree murder. Just the day before, a warrant for his arrest was issued related to an alleged assault that took place in Vancouver earlier this year. But police say that wasn't why the officer was there. Constable Yang was asked to assist in a notification to him that he was not permitted to be in the park. Uh, they weren't there to remove him at the time. Investigators say Yang shot Ham after she was allegedly attacked and that cameras nearby captured it all. He is expected to survive. Local residents say the accused had been living in the park for around eight months. I've seen him at the subway and I've seen him walking and most of the time he's got a pretty big smile on his face. But some say he shouldn't have been living there at all. He could have been removed and maybe he needed the help, but like that should not happen. It should have been prevented. Police say trying to support those in need is why the 31-year-old officer volunteered to work in the homeless outreach unit. To go into this line of work and to help people and then to have to, to pass away on the job, it's very heartbreaking. A devastating loss for her family and fellow officers. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Thousands of police officers from across Canada and the U.S. are expected at a funeral tomorrow in Ontario for two police constables killed in the line of duty. Today, private visitations were held at two separate funeral homes for constables Morgan Russell and Devin Northrup. They were shot and killed eight days ago while responding to a call at a home in Innisfil, just north of Toronto. Tomorrow's funeral in Barrie isn't open to the public, but people are invited to pay their respects right along the procession route. Now, inflation is cooling a bit in this country, but new data shows food prices are just soaring at a pace not seen in decades. So the overall inflation rate hit 6.9% in September. That's down just a little bit from 7% in August. Gas prices helped slow inflation, but food prices are pushing back. According to Statistics Canada, they jumped 11.4% compared to just a year earlier. And that is a pain so many Canadians feel every time they leave the grocery store. Nisha Patel takes a look at what's behind it. These days, a full grocery cart means an empty wallet. Everything costs more, the basics milk, bread. Something has to be done. This is ridiculous. Many shoppers are doing what they can to get by. Just go in and get your groceries now. You kind of look for better deals. I never looked for those discount stickers in my life, my entire life. But now I search them out. Cereal costs almost 18% more compared to a year ago. Baked goods nearly 15%. Prices for fresh vegetables are almost 12% higher. This independent grocer is offering imperfect produce for less. People are looking for that deal. People um, are not caring as much about how pretty that apple is. The store suppliers are charging 20% more in some cases, and while the owners are trying not to pass that on, it's getting tough to compete with big chains. We're just uh, really struggling in that sense, in keeping up with the cost and as well keeping 
items on our shelves for our customers. There are a lot of factors driving this. Fertilizer is more expensive, bad weather is hurting crops, and Russia's war on Ukraine is driving up global grain prices. Consumers are also paying more for cars and furniture, though average gas prices fell 7 percent last month compared to the month before. We're headed in the right direction, I think, as supply chains adjust and as demand gradually cools in response to higher borrowing costs, uh, but it's still going to require some patience. While the overall inflation rate cooled, this economist says core inflation, which strips out volatile items like food and energy, is still too hot. History shows cooling these effects through higher borrowing costs is the better route usually. So experts say the Bank of Canada has more work to do, and many predict interest rates will go up by 50 to 75 basis points next week. So none of this is good, but I think the bottom line is that, that people just want to know is there any relief in sight when it comes to food prices? In the short term, Adrian, there's not a lot. The Canadian dollar is really weak right now, so all of those fresh fruits and vegetables that we import over the winter are going to cost more, and unfortunately, those costs will likely show up on grocery bills. In the longer term, economists tell me that prices for some things, like bread and cereal, will eventually come down maybe a little bit, but for some items, this is the new normal. The really important thing, though, is that food prices overall grow at a more manageable pace instead of the double-digit increases we've been seeing. Uh, well, that will be a help. All right, Nisha Patel, thank you. You're welcome. So groceries are one pain point, but the federal government is warning there will be more to come. David Cochran now with what Ottawa says it can and cannot do to help. A blunt warning from the Deputy Prime Minister. Times are tough. They're about to get tougher. Our economy will slow as the central bank continues to step in to tackle inflation. It's doing that by raising interest rates, a solution to one problem which creates new ones. Mortgage payments will rise. Business will no longer be booming. Our unemployment rate will no longer be at its record low. And so inflation remains the biggest challenge on Freeland's plate as Canadians struggle to fill theirs due to rising costs of everyday essentials. Low-income people are just, um, they're just getting overwhelmed by uh, these higher food prices. A lot of their, you know, their more limited income is going to food. Inflation has dropped from a high of 8.1% this summer to 6.9% now. But with a target rate of 2%, that's like a car doing 69 in a 20 zone. It's slowing down, but still way too fast. Oral questions, question oral. The result, says the opposition, of the Liberals' lead foot approach to spending. The Royal Bank says that the average family will pay $3,000 more in inflation and higher interest rates. These are the results of the half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits. Canadians are cutting back on costs, and so too is our government. From this point, spending will be limited. So will government aid. We can't support every single Canadian in the way we did with the emergency measures that we put in place at the height of the pandemic. Instead, the focus will be on helping low-income Canadians, like the recent move to double the GST rebate. Any future help will follow that pattern to avoid adding fuel to the inflationary fire. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Britons are also feeling economic pain. Their inflation rate hit 10.1% today, making those calls for Prime Minister Liz Truss to resign a lot louder. She answered her political opponents today like this. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. Well, this brand new British government appears to be in complete chaos. Truss is struggling even for her own party support after her economic plan threw the country into chaos. She scrapped that plan and her finance minister. Now she's lost another senior member. Home Secretary Suella Braverman said she resigned after breaching ministerial rules, but she left with a stinging letter, a not-so-veiled attack on Truss reading, in part, the business of government relies upon people accepting responsibility for their mistakes. Canada's chief public health officer is urging everyone to get their COVID booster shots and to get them soon.
As Karen Paul shows us, that message comes with a warning of what could happen if more Canadians don't roll up their sleeves. At this Toronto vaccination clinic, people are preparing for a potential surge in COVID-19. People, they're just over it. Um, but like the science is there. The science leading to pleas like this one from Canada's top doctor. Keep your COVID-19 vaccinations up to date. Because she says the alternative could be a possible return to restrictions. Whether, for example, mask wearing would help at least reduce some of that spread and the impact on the health system. Of course, many of these measures are taken at uh, the local and provincial levels as well. I'm not here announcing any restrictions. But Manitoba's premier is encouraging people to get a booster shot. We want Manitobans to be healthy so that they're at work and uh, that they're able to help contribute to our economy. About 80% of Canadians have received at least two COVID shots. Half the population has had a third dose, but a fourth shot? Just 14%. Based on daily infection numbers, experts describe the risk of catching COVID very high nationally, the highest level, severe, in Alberta, British Columbia and Prince Edward Island. You're going to be in, in uh, deep doo-doo <laughs> in a month or two if you don't start acting at this, at this time. This ICU doctor doesn't expect a deluge of COVID patients in hospital, but... If there's a outbreak among healthcare workers, then it can shut down significant parts of the hospital uh, capacity. And if that happens, he hopes politics won't trump science. If the situation becomes su sufficiently worrisome, then I think uh, the government will, will have to act. Back at the Toronto vaccination clinic, this man is worried about infecting his elderly mother. Masks went away indoors, so I'd be happy to see that come back. If more people like him take precautions voluntarily, Maybe governments won't have to step in. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. An Olympic gold medalist is speaking out against Hockey Canada. Katie Weatherston suffered career-ending injuries while on Team Canada. She calls the financial aid she got from Hockey Canada an insult. Ashley Burke explains why. In their semifinal, right in front comes Katie Weatherston. When the pressure was on, Katie Weatherston delivered for Hockey Canada. But she says when she needed Hockey Canada, it didn't deliver for her. I felt like they just threw me to the wayside. I didn't matter. I didn't matter as a person. I didn't matter. My health didn't matter. All right, let's go. After bringing home Olympic gold in 2006, Weatherston says she suffered multiple hits to the head while on Team Canada that eventually cut her career short. I didn't say anything for a while because you want to play again. You're thinking you're going to get better. You don't want to go up against Hockey Canada. Right? You don't want to be blacklisted. In 2012, a doctor reported to Hockey Canada that Weatherston had a concussion with prolonged post-concussion syndrome that was possibly permanent. So Weatherston asked Hockey Canada for help with medical bills, which she says now average $15,000 a year. I've even told them I've had to take time off work. I don't have insurance. And all I got back to my emails was, unfortunately, the $4,000 is all that I have to work with. Sorry. The time limit had passed to submit an insurance claim or sue. She assumed Hockey Canada didn't have the money to help until this summer, when it revealed it had millions in reserve funds used to pay out sexual abuse allegations. It just brought back all the emotions I went through during this time. It was just an extra, you know, shot to the gut. Weatherston and her partner now question Hockey Canada's priorities. Why should she suffer? when they had the capacity to help. Hockey Canada says the safety of our athletes is our highest priority, and there are different insurance policies or self-insured funds that may be available, but wouldn't comment on the specifics of Weatherston's case. Want a treat? Good girl. For now, she's living a slower life and says she'd give up her gold medal for her health. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Spencerville, Ontario. The Iranian climber who sparked international concern after competing without a hijab is back in Tehran tonight. El Naz Rakabi received quite the welcome. Those are just some of the hundreds who showed up at the airport before dawn chanting El Naz is a heroine. Speaking to Iranian state media, Rakabi repeated what was posted to her Instagram account 
after the competition in Seoul that she simply forgot to wear a hijab after being suddenly called to compete. She later met with Iran's sports minister. Iran has seen weeks of protest after a young woman accused of wearing her head covering incorrectly died in police custody. It is a record-breaking October in Alberta with summer-like temperatures well into the fall. It's been absolutely beautiful. We've been extremely lucky this year. Why some say it could spell trouble in the future. Next. A big mess on Canada's busiest highway. This dump box uh, came off of the truck. The strange sight and rush hour chaos. Plus more of our interview with the Ukrainian president. You mentioned as you sat down that there was just a drone attack today. Volodymyr Zelensky's assessment of the war and his gratitude to Canada. We're back at two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. This dump box uh, came off of the truck that's just down the road. What a mess. It was a brutal rush hour commute this morning on Canada's busiest highway because that is the box of a dump truck that slammed into and then got stuck under an overpass right on the 401 just west of Toronto. The driver says he forgot to lower it after dropping off a load. It was wedged right there for hours, and so were many other poor drivers stuck in traffic as engineers assess the damage to the overpass. And there is a new assessment tonight of the record-setting damage in Atlantic Canada caused by Fiona. An initial estimate says the storm caused $660 million in insured damage. That would be the highest bill ever for a disaster in Atlantic Canada, according to the Insurance Board of Canada. But a lot more damage is not covered by insurance. So the Bureau says the government will have to pay an even larger bill. Air quality advisories continue in southern BC as ongoing wildfires just choke the region with smoke. The skies over Chilliwack, thick gray today. The same thing in Vancouver. Parts of BC's Lower Mainland and the Fraser Valley are under Environment Canada's highest possible pollution rating tonight. The smoke is expected to last until Friday. And if you're in Alberta, well, lucky you. It still feels like summer there with temperatures well into the 20s. The province has already broken dozens of October heat records. But, of course, there's a but. As Aaron Collins shows us, there could be trouble ahead. Like a gift that keeps on giving. Record-breaking warm weather lingering in Alberta, sparking conversations. We were actually just talking about it when we got here. It's been absolutely beautiful. We've been extremely lucky this year. People have been calling it hotum. What do you think of that? Hotum, yeah, that's a good term. I bought like winter baby clothes and I'm not needing them yet, so. So just how warm is it? Well, hot enough to make one more trim of the lawn necessary making a tough transition for those in business to mow and clear snow. This is more like June than October. Yeah, it's been warmer this October than, than June of this year, which is, makes no sense to me. I think that the seasons have just moved. The growing season may have moved too. Oh, it really smells good. Lettuce still coming up at this farm, even with Halloween just around the corner. We estimate that since we've been here, we probably have another, on average, another 15 days of growing season. And that's, basically, it's climate change. He might be right. Heat waves are nothing new here. That's just weather. But this hot, dry spell is lasting longer than most, a temperature shift that many experts attribute to climate change, a potential problem for Alberta's farmers next spring. And if this drying out of our soils is not balanced by increased precipitation events, well, then we are going to have more drought conditions. And this is unfortunately what we are facing for the next spring. So while warmer fall weather is a welcome change, it's a worry too. You know, you hear all this stuff about global warming and stuff. So I'm enjoying it, but in the back of my mind, uh, it's kind of concerning. A pleasant surprise that could signal trouble down the road. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up after the break, we'll return to our interview with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. I want to ask you about the nuclear threat. 
ніхто не знає, що завтра буде робити. The kind of wartime access Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky gave to Canadian journalists is unprecedented. There were just three reporters in the room with him, including our Briar Stewart. No script, no conditions. And as you'll hear, he was at times blunt, thoughtful, and for Canada, grateful. First of all, I would like to say that Canada is reacting promptly enough to our requests uh, concerning the support of Ukraine, and this is true. It doesn't only relate to our relations with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, although this has direct uh, impact on our warm relations and the opportunity to talk at any moment. Therefore, I'm very grateful, but I'm sure that this is first of all the influence the influentiality of the community of population of Canada towards Ukraine. It was before Justin and before me, and I'm sure that after us it will remain as is. Canada supports not just with armored vehicles, I'm grateful, by the way, for the reaction to this request of mine, but I can probably say that this is an armored support. I mean, we talk, if this is resolutions in the General Assembly of the UN concerning the support of our sovereignty of the Crimea as a part of our country, support of any resolution about territorial integrity of Ukraine, support in uh, condemning aggression. This is more than partnership. It's something more, something bigger. It's like being relatives regardless of the distance. I want to emphasize once again the distance between the states is not measured in kilometers. It is measured in completely different things, in values and in attitudes towards each other's history. Therefore, Canada has supported us. I don't remember the entire number. I hope uh, Prime Minister Trudeau won't be offended, but I think it's about two billion Canadian dollars. It's a very powerful support. I realize that this is not the money of the government, but first of all, it is the money of the society and the taxpayers. So I'm truly grateful. You know, you mentioned as you sat down that there was just a drone attack today. We saw a deadly attack the other day. We saw policemen shooting at them to bring them down. Is Ukraine able to deal with the drone threat? We're ready to deal with it. We're not just ready. It's not the first day that Ukraine's been showing that we do fight and we can win all that, overcome all that. We just need partners. First of all, Ukrainian energy sector, Ukrainian community is now suffering due to the lack of anti-aircraft and anti-missile defense systems. Anti-aircraft, anti-missile defense for us today is very, very important. These are the systems that can save our society from these targeted terror attacks. And sure, of course, the main mission today of Russia is they're hitting precisely our energy system. Their goal is for the people to have no light. They are terrorists. I want to ask you about the nuclear threat. We've heard warnings from the Kremlin for quite some time. Do you think Russia would launch a nuclear strike? And how do you begin to prepare the population for that possibility? Nobody knows what Russia will do tomorrow. But we do know what the world has to do not to have one threat or others. As to using nuclear weapons, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Ukraine is in NATO or not a NATO member state. It's happening in Europe, on European continent. Nobody is allowed to simply blackmail once again blackmail as a terrorist. 
the one who orders to kill people. If you do that, you have to know that in a second, regardless of the result of your hit, there will be a hit at your decision-making center in your state. We can talk about humane things for a long time, but we live in the situation and with the kind of neighbor with who, who doesn't understand anything but power and the society in the Russian Federation must know they attack our society. Your president is killing civilians. If you don't exert pressure on your president, then the world will be isolated from you, will isolate itself from you. The world won't talk to you. You speak in the language of threats. You won't have places to rest abroad. We don't want to have any connections with you. You cannot earn. You cannot have business with the world, with Europe, with Canada, with the United States. What kind of business are you talking? You support the authorities of terrorists. I want to get back to President Putin for a moment because you've said you won't negotiate with him you've even signed a decree forbidding it does that mean you only think this war can end when Putin is no longer in power I think that all in all in Russia there will definitely be a leadership that in one way or another Ukraine will talk to but under the condition there is no war, but under the condition there is not the language ultimatums, but that is a dialogue, given that there is respect to our sovereignty and our nation and our state. Will there be a return to the state of relations that we had before the war? I'm sure not. They took too many people, too many lives. The society will not forgive them that, but politically, we are geographically neighbors. The level of the relations will depend on the way the return happens and depending on the price we return our lands. It will be the choice of our society whether to talk to them or not to talk at all. And for how many years, tens of years or more, how much it will take after this war until the societies will start, start communicating again, but no one knows that. Given that we know there are some groups, particularly in the East, that are pro-Russian, if Ukraine is able to take back all of its territory, what happens to those people? The people will get security, the people will get European civilization, people will get peace, protection, borders, salaries, capitals of Europe and the United States and Canada. Investors won't be uh, scared but will invest the money in the country. That's not at war. That's what those people will get. It's not us, it's all of us. You don't have, we can't separate those people if some of them wants to stay a citizen of the Russian Federation, well, no problem. Nobody's gonna persecute that person. This person may just go to the Russian Federation and live there. That's, that's as simple as that. A person with the passport of Ukraine cannot be a citizen of the Russian Federation. I... Uh, I don't let myself, I don't allow myself to get used to it. You can get used to the war, get used to the number of the victims, you can get used emotionally. Ah, killings, killings, it's the war after all, consequences of the war, but me, I live with the idea that I'm not ready to get used to us suffering, to get used to war, to get used to not feeling pain from the chaos, and therefore I need the energy to, for it to motivate me every day to advance towards the victory. I want to stay a living human being, not just physically alive, because the president of Russia is physically alive, but there are certain questions about everything else.
So, Breyer, that was just part of your hour-long conversation with Zelensky. We have a lot more to talk about with you, including the feeling in that moment in the room. I know I have some questions, too. We will get to that right after the break. Uh, something escape. Our defense system is working. Everything for the Ukrainian president, even an interview with Breyer Stewart, happens under fire. And as you heard, despite that calm, Zelensky says he refuses to get used to it. So, Breyer, that moment looked tense in there in terms of the air raid sirens going off. What was the feeling like there? Well, that air raid siren went off just as we were setting up for the interview. So there was some discussion with staff about whether we should go down to the shelter or stay and proceed. And in the end, when the, the president walked in, that was really the first thing he did was tell us he'd be, you know, frequently checking his phone because there were missile strikes. And that can kind of continued all throughout the interview. And on the one hand, I think he wanted to update us on the situation. But on the other hand, I think he wanted to reassure us. And when we heard those bangs, you know, he, he kind of had a grin on his face when he said that that is the missile defense system working. And, and I'm curious what the process was like to get to that room. And I ask that appreciating that, you know, security concerns mean that there's obviously some stuff you just can't talk about. Well, yes, and we were able to disclose the location where that interview took place. It's at the office of the president, and it's in a compound uh, that's kind of sealed off, and it's where he both works and he lives. And there were obviously a number of checkpoints that we had to go through uh, to get into that room. And, of course, after we went through security, we had to give up our electronic devices, including our phones and laptops. And in the course of the interview, uh, one thing I noticed in the transcript is that Zelensky was asked directly, you know, did you order that crucial bridge between Crimea and Russia blown up? How did he handle that question? I would say he took a pause. He chose his words carefully and he said that we didn't order it. And then he went on to suggest that it was perhaps Russians that did it because of some kind of internal unrest. Do you have an impression, uh, Breyer, of how you think he's holding up? I think all things considered, he's doing pretty well. I mean, he was seemed to be very energetic. We did ask him about just kind of uh, his emotional state. And he said that he doesn't want to get used to the idea of living through war. He doesn't want to get, you know, hear about killings and not be affected by it. He says when he is emotionally affected, that's kind of what motivates him to, to keep fighting. But he also did talk about the need to kind of take a mental break, uh, to go out, you know, into the communities and to talk to people or even, you know, go for a ride in the car just to kind of take a step back from things. And in terms of you and the team, I know you're there with Corinne, you're there with Fred, and I'm wondering... You know, you've been there through a pretty striking time, certainly with the drones and the bridge blowing up. What is your gut telling you uh, about where the conflict is at now? I would say it's in a dark place, and all signs suggest that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And you have Ukraine and Western intelligence officials believe that there have been so many airstrikes here because Russia is losing ground on the battlefield. And right now you have the Ukrainian military trying to retake Kherson. That's an area that Russia has said it's annexed. And so you really do wonder if the Russian military pulls back from there or, or loses that area, just how the country will respond. And do you see that, that notion of a dark time re reflected sort of on the faces of the people you meet every day? Can you, can you feel that there? You know, I think there are, are two things, and I think it does kind of depend on, on where people are living. I mean, we were in the city of Zaporizhia that was hit every night, really, for a period of 10 days, and they had over 70 people die. Uh, people there were very um, traumatized by what had happening. You had people that were deciding to put their kids on trains to send them to western Ukraine because they didn't think it was safe for them to be there anymore. I think here in the capital, you really do see people... Uh, trying to, you know, continue to go about their daily lives. As soon as that siren ends or the missile strikes ends, they, you know, come back up to the street and, and try to continue on. But I think the real question is, the real unknown is just, if this continues on, the strikes, at the pace that it is, at what point do, do people's psyches change and they do become more affected by it and they do start to change their behavior or even in some cases, you know, leave for safer ground? All right, Briar, an enormous thanks to you and the whole team. Welcome. Coming up next on The National, as Canadians return to movie theaters, some independent cinemas say they're being left behind. It really is discouraging to see that it seems to be an act of greed. 
why they're pointing fingers at some big names. Plus, the story behind this artistic fusion, Fredericton meets Toronto meets Lego in tonight's moment. Independent cinemas are struggling to bounce back with pandemic restrictions lifted, and they say the big chains are to blame. Lisa Shing shows us why. While business is starting to pick up again, Vancouver's Rio Theatre is still struggling. It's extremely frustrating. Many independent theatres have traditionally had to wait several weeks to show new films. Now it's up to six months, like for the South Korean film Parasite and dark comedy Everything Everywhere All at Once. These cinemas are caught between big chains and distributors. They blame Cineplex for monopolizing the market, considering it owns about 75% of the screens in Canada. We've been told by distributors that if they give the film to us, then Cineplex will not play the film in their theaters. Cineplex would not respond to CBC News' inquiries about these practices, but said in a statement, ultimately, it is up to film distributors where they play their movies. It did not agree to an interview. Neither did several distributors we reached out to. It really is discouraging to see that it seems to be an act of greed, also a lack of concern for the consumer. A couple of years ago, that theater owner filed a complaint with the Competition Bureau, but it stalled. Some legal experts say the competition laws are subjective, so it's tough to prove Cineplex is doing anything wrong. They're also getting hit from yet another angle. Many indie cinemas say Cineplex is branching out into their niche, art house films. We're not a discount second-run theater. We're just second-run because we can't be anything else. All this as the pandemic has changed how people get their entertainment. Those audiences that might have gone to independent theaters to see these films are now choosing to stay home. And that's all tied in with, you know, the way our movie going habits have changed as a result of the pandemic. I was five and he... In the meantime, these theaters are forced to find other options. That means hosting live music or renting out the venue to stay alive. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so movies are one form of art, but this, this is something else entirely. That is Lego, and it speaks to one man's love of his city. Well, actually, cities, really. Cities, plural, because what you're about to see is a mashup. One part Fredericton, one part Toronto, a labor of love born from the pandemic, and tonight, it's our moment. I started like building some things with my son and I realized that the Lego was totally different than when I was a kid. You could do a lot more with it nowadays. And the idea hit me one day being at like downtown Fredericton, I was like, what did it look like if it was actually like a big city feel like where I'm from? So I combined where I'm from and Fredericton into one. I keep thinking back to like where I'm from, Toronto. What does Toronto have that Fredericton doesn't have? A lot of major cities have a Chinatown. So what I wanted to do is create like a Chinatown block. So I, I take like the Fredericton businesses and I apply them to that block. It came out amazing and people really love that block. When I'm putting together these buildings, I, I start from the base and then I start with the door and the windows and then you add your signage and then I like to weather my buildings so they look like they've been there like a hundred years. You got to get the right feel and the right attitude from that building. This is how my imagination works. The buildings are familiar when you look at them but then you're like oh wow like uh, this feels different. A lot of people saying that the exhibit was magical. Everyone was smiling as they're looking at it like wow like that's what it could look like if it was like a big city. I, I am I am astonished by this, Chris. And my pandemic project was simply not to get sick. Uh, you invented a universe, and he says he's never quite done. He's looking to, you know, maybe put a little bit of graffiti on some of the walls. It just, it never ends, and it's beautiful. That is a national for October the 19th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.